Last week, just like everyone else probably, I was watching the Summer Games Fest, when a highly anticipated game from my childhood was announced that it was getting a remake. Final Fantasy Tactics is one of those games that a lot of 90s kids have fond or perhaps frustrating memories of, but when I saw the remake, something caught my eye. Something about the way the characters moved and looked made me want to try and see if I could recreate the same style of movement in the Godot game engine, which I initially thought would be easy. Something that I didn't realize though is that while 3D navigation is baked into most engines these days, they are able to produce paths at much higher detail and use Euclidean distance to calculate the path to their destination. In fact, Godot's 3D navigation is so simple that most of the code required fits mostly onto half of this notepad. However, if you want a square grid with 2D style Manhattan pathfinding, you're going to need a whole lot more paper. Let's take a closer look at what we're trying to achieve with this exercise. This is Final Fantasy Tactics War of the Lions on Android. You can see that when we select a player, there is a set of tiles that light up as move options. And when we move a player, they very clearly move to their starting point, to their ending point without making any diagonals. And only once they're aligned with their access of their destination, do they ever turn towards it. This is something called Manhattan Distance. The easiest way for me to explain this is that Euclidean Distance finds the shortest possible path, and this is what Gitto uses for its built-in pathfinding. And if we implemented this on our grid, we would simply send our player directly to the point. Manhattan Distance, on the other hand, named after the city Manhattan, measures the distance between two points on a grid-like path, which is exactly what we need. Fortunately for us, Godot has a built-in A-star helper class, so we don't need to roll our own. We only need to override the cost functions, and we should be able to recreate the effect. And on top of that, they even have a Manhattan distance snippet that we can use. But, much like my mental health, it doesn't work at all. But I'm getting ahead of myself, because we don't even have a grid yet. One unique thing that I really like about FFT is that it's 3D. And a lot of these games these days are made in 2D. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that there's a charm to being able to rotate the map. I think it's just a really cool feature. I thought I'd show you guys something a little bit different. I've been doing some digging and it turns out there's quite a bit of a modding community around Final Fantasy Tactics. And if you have access to a Final Fantasy CD, you can load it up and extract the maps from the game and view them in this map maker called Gainsha, Gainsha DX. And this is the map from the starting of the game. I thought it'd be a cool one to have a look at and just give an idea about how this game was originally done. And you can see the map, it's, it's all pretty basic stuff. We've got like normals and whatnot um, sticking out of these. The mesh is cool, but the terrain is the thing that I think we should be most interested in because there are two sets of meshes. There's the terrain mesh, right? And then there's the polygon mesh. So this is the one you see. And this is the one that's interacting with the engine to figure out where to put you and where you're going and all of that stuff. And I find that really interesting. If I had to guess, this is just so that they can feed, they take this mesh, obviously the player can't see it and they feed it to the engine so they can figure out the points in the world where to go. I'm not gonna create a separate mesh and feed those points in. I'm actually gonna use ray casting because it's faster. I don't, I don't even know if the PlayStation was capable of doing that many ray casts over. Bunch of reasons you would feed in a mesh like this to figure out the world points and like the the slope and all that kind of stuff you can see here you can see the height uh the slope type slope surface natural all that you know there's a bunch of different pieces of information that you can figure out and i think that's really cool i originally thought to use a grid map but let's be honest it kind of sucks to work with and on top of that, you have to be incredibly careful about how you build it because the height of the point can only either be at the bottom or the midpoint of the block, which means you cannot have variety in your map. Something that I think makes a really big impact on the way that maps look. But if you were going for like an ogre tactics kind of look, then I think this would work really well, actually. Either way though, I decided to build a 16 by 16 grid in Blender and add a bit of elevation I found working in Blender a lot easier to work with than making some boxes and creating a grid map. This map is very basic, but here's one with proper textures that I made for a bit of fun afterwards. I did use a 2D tile set 
that I got from Itch as a kind of trim sheet, and I think it looks really nice. But anyway, now I have a map, I need to be able to build a grid. So to get a grid, I simply grab the AABB of the demo level. We can use this to set the boundary of our grid. Um, so it could be different sizes. It doesn't have to be 16 by 16. I also defined a grid size of one by one meter. And this could also be any size we wanted it to be, but obviously you want the grid size to be divisible by the map size. So this just makes looping the map really easy as I just need to raycast every one meter determine the height of the grid location and yeah i decided to use raycasts to figure out the height of the point if this was a flat map this wouldn't really matter but in final fantasy tactics verticality is one of the things that make it the most interesting i also want to point out that if you were going to do this in production it might make more sense to set this up as a tool uh, and there might even be better ways to do it it's just the first thing that popped into my head Sometimes the best option is the one you can make work. I set up a debug texture to spawn so I could confirm the grid matches up with what I'm expecting. I also had to add an offset variable because you want these textures to show up in the center of the point and I'll actually have a use for them later. While we're looping over this grid, I store both the grid point, which is just a vector two representation of the grid and the world point, which is the location returned by the raycast. I also store here the debug textures and any characters that we find along the way. Okay, so now we have some points that we think should be a part of the A star algorithm, but so what? How do we get these points into the algorithm and start making paths? Well, you just use the function add point. It's actually really easy at this point. We've done all the heavy lifting. The hardest part of this exercise is knowing what to add. The rest is mostly easy. The next part can be a little bit tricky and that is how to get the characters to walk on a diagonal, right? And listen, I know, this is an entirely pointless exercise, right? It's a modern engine, you've got yourself a square grid, just go make a strategy game. You don't need to worry so much about the characters moving. It's so stupid. But if we wanna stay true to the inspiration, we've gotta get these bean boys walking in right angles. Am I right? Or what? What's the point of this video otherwise? So our focus now switches to the next step of creating an A-star algorithm in Godot, which is connecting the points. You see, when you are using this A-star class in Godot, there are only two things you need to do to get it up and running. You just need the points, which we obviously just got, but you also need to tell Godot which points are connected to each other. So for each point, what are the connected points that can be considered for pathfinding? And like we said, remember, no diagonals. So why even connect diagonal points. You see, at first I was looping over the grid size in the X and the Z and adding every single point, which would include diagonals, uh, which if we don't want to ever walk over, you don't ever need to connect. Seems obvious, but for a while I was relying solely on the compute and estimate cost functions to fix all my problems. And rather than testing each and every single option, it's a way easier just not to have them be considered as an option to calculate the move against. This helps cut down the, on the calculations and helps prevent edge cases that you might not pick up with your compute cost algorithm. And you can see even with my final A star cost function, I still get diagonals even if I include them. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, we can raycast to a point and set the path. And yes, there will be no diagonals, but this is far from perfect because it's jaggy as heck it sways around more than me walking home from a night out with the boys. Like, that's literally me. I'm just waiting for a mate. Is that why your car's all smashed up and you're up on the grass at the moment or what? Yeah. We're all over the shop. We want clean, straight lines, which brings us all the way back to our compute cost function. You know how I said the function, you know, it doesn't work? Well, I'm not being 100% honest. That's right, I lied. But the truth is, this jagged path is still technically Manhattan pathfinding, but we can make it better. I experimented with a few different things, but I eventually realized that the reason it was jaggy is because we're including all the accesses in the cost calculation. And this is not technically wrong. You see, the A star algorithm works by computing two values. One is the cost of the path from the starting position to whatever point we're testing and 
the cost of the path from the N position to the point we're testing. These two figures are called compute cost and estimate cost in Godot. And we can override them in our A star class to create an algorithm that suits our needs. The issue I found with the basic Manhattan algorithm in Godot is that it doesn't care too much about which axis, and realistically, this is the fastest path to get here, right? So if we slow this down and take a look at the calculations, we can see that there are actually many choices that it could have taken that have the same cost, but it just takes the first one it finds, resulting in a kind of zigzag. It actually took me quite a lot of testing to figure out the best approach for this. This was mainly because my lack of understanding for pathfinding. When I first started this journey, I didn't even know what each function did. Um, I would just poke at the pathfinding algorithm until it looked better. Um, and it wasn't actually until I started making this devlog that I actually determined the best approach. You see, my first solution was to provide a slight cost reduction to the Z or the X axis. And this would make the cheapest path always be that access. That is until you aligned with the destination. I had also realized that I could fully remove either of those axes from the cost calculation and I would get the same result. However, once I put together the cost calculation demonstration for this video, it was really clear that providing a cost reduction was actually much faster than simply removing an axis. And this is because if you remove the axis from the calculation, once you reach that axis, it's going to cost zero no matter which direction you go, which means it has to search in both directions until it reaches its destination. Now, I actually don't think this extra pathfinding time would have a huge impact on the overall game. It only has to do a pathfind every click. So this calculation isn't happening often, but it's worth knowing that it is faster, so we should use the cost reduction method. Editing Isaac here. Uh, I was kind of talking out of my ass when I said that it was faster. I didn't actually know, I was just sort of intuiting. Well, I decided to set up a quick little test. I don't know how significant, or I don't know how accurate this test is. Um, GD Quest, I got this from GD Quest, so uh, props because um, counting the frames doesn't work because this happens in less than a frame. Uh, but I decided to test it, so basically we start the timer when we click the, the path, and when we find out the end of the path, we call this function here. We test the difference between the two, divided by a thousand. As you can see here, I've been testing it, and I've been showing you in the edit the results. Now, yeah, I just don't, I don't think this is material, but uh, it's faster, I think. Uh, based on this test at least, on average, maybe 0 0.0001 millisecond? I, I guess it's like a couple of, it's like one millisecond faster, I guess. So, you know, now we know. Okay, back to it. Right now, it's a fixed axis. I just give a reduction to the X axis, but if I had 3D models and they rotated, I would probably make them walk in the direction they were facing first before they turned. But since we can't tell with these beans, I'm not gonna bother. Okay, so that's like most of the game, right? There's definitely not a robust job system, combat, managing turns, an AI that I need to make. I just spent two weeks on making this thing. I think we're good to go, right? Well, actually, since I was able to figure this out, I gave up like three times. I was pretty hyped to keep working on this project. I was able to set up the move restrictions and the display pretty easily. Since I was using a decal to help with debugging the grid placement, I added a few more textures and just changed the color depending on how you're interacting with the characters on the map. So if you're attacking, it's red. If you're moving, it's blue. And that's about it. I created some stats, which don't really do much right now but I gave a speed stat, which just determines how big the circle gets, right? So this is Brink. And now when I press move, he can move within his circle, which is pretty cool. I also gave them the ability to attack each other. It's pretty basic. Actually, the code is pretty rushed. I essentially just check if there's a character in the tile selected and apply a damage calculation, which is also not that complicated. I think I stole this from Pokemon. 
I, I, I don't know, I googled RPG damage calculation formula. This whole turn controller is almost an entire other video in itself. It could also be used for a turn-based RPG, I think. It probably just needs a refactor or two. I have this thing where if I'm prototyping for something for the first time, it's pretty messy. The map controller in itself is like 500 lines. And I was looking through the code before and the attack and move functions are identical except they make the tile a different color. Like they could be the same function and you could just pass a constant depending on the input. I mean, and you can't really blame me, but I wasn't able to do the jumping that's in Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, in Final Fantasy Tactics, your soldiers could like do these wild jumps and you could also push people off edges and stuff. But coding that is actually pretty tough with at least how I've done it. Um, if you have any ideas, definitely let me know. Um, um, what, the one thought I had is if I did a separate A star for each move, I could calculate their jump and if they could reach that particular tile. Maybe. I, I, I tried it a couple times that had mixed results and so I just sort of decided to leave it out. The AI is also incredibly basic. They seek out the closest enemy and whack them. Then once in range, they just hit the person with the lowest health. It's really not that complicated. They also can't do spells because... They never went to school. You know, typical stuff. And that is pretty much it. I added like a, a victory or defeat screen depending on if you won or they won, but there's no way to repeat the game. There's just two characters and you can cast your spells. Heal, uh, heal is pretty funny. Um, it's just negative damage. That seems to work. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, other than that, yeah. I think it's a pretty fun little prototype. I really enjoyed making it. I learned a ton about pathfinding because you just have to put in so much effort to get these guys moving the way that you want them to. Even if you didn't care about the whole like right angle, uh, non zigzag or non diagonal movement, just setting up the grid and getting it to work with the A star is necessary. If you wanted to do a grid based game, I'm fairly certain you wouldn't be able to do that with the rig regular pathfinding because of the way that it sort of handles edges but i guess it just depends on how you want to approach that because so i think you could mix the two you could have your grid which is what your mouse interacts with and your characters are sent to that center point but like you could still use the regular pathfinding node stuff within Godot. maybe like i don't really know i think this is probably a better approach at least for like a turn-based strategy um game rather than a real-time one uh but yeah, like, I think it's probably worthy of a tutorial. I don't think it's going to be... It's pretty hard because it's a very specific kind of setup, like the way that you need to work with the meshes and the the way that you set up the grid. I, I think maybe if you would want a general approach, you would take it and you just give it a size like 16 by 16 or whatever, rather than taking that from the mesh, depending on like how you were building your levels. Because like, obviously I've done it in a way that is very specific to the mesh. It, the mesh has to be... A square it can't really be anything else it would have to be a rectangle at least um but yeah like i said you make a tool to to set the points or something like that i don't i don't know you know um but otherwise it was a really fun endeavor um i hope you guys have enjoyed definitely hit the like and subscribe if you want to see more thank you for all these beautiful people above me that have supported and gotten access to the third person controller which is still going so if you want to learn how to make a third person shooter which is nothing like this but if you want to learn that you can join up with the patreon or become a channel member and you get access to that plus the source code of anything that i've made uh, it's not always directly available just like send me a message and i'll give it to you um, but this this will be available. I made a community post. So if you're a member and you want to get access to the source code, um, there's a community post that you can um, that you can uh, click to get access to this. But yeah, other than that, guys, uh, that's all for this one. Uh, maybe I'll keep working on this. I don't know. It's pretty fun. I've been enjoying working on it. Um, but other than that, guys, I will see you all next time.